I've spent a lot of the pandemic revisiting the work of my favorite filmmakers, and lately I've had particular fun with the Hong Kong oeuvre of action master John Woo. Wu's distinctive style has been relentlessly co-opted, parodied, plagiarized, and worshipped in popular culture all over the world, to the extent that even going over his trademarks feels kind of redundant. But as people tend to focus on the way he directs action sequences specifically, I'll throw in a few other techniques he uses in moments of downtime. First, obviously, consistent use of slow motion, specifically to highlight the impact of bullets, fists, and the like, while the attacker and sound design proceed at regular speed. This keeps the action and the damage done legible and painful without slowing down the pace, or even feeling as gratuitous as it probably should. Sam Peckinpah did kind of pioneer some of this, which Wu has acknowledged, but the two have vastly different pacing in their edits. People shit doves when shit's about to go down, a clear symbolic cue of innocence taking its leave, graceful wuxia-inspired choreography with characters diving, spinning, jumping, and more, characters mirroring each other's behavior, dissolves as a stylistic pacing choice rather than to illustrate the passage of time, freeze frames to highlight the emotions of a moment, elaborate moving cameras even in simple dialogue scenes, characters inspired by noir fiction, downbeat endings where the protagonist must right the wrong or accept responsibility for it, more homoerotic sexual tension than you can shake a VHS copy of Commando at, and lastly, emotionally unselfconscious, earnestly over-the-top, passionate central performances. Gonna open a new tab here real quick. This element in particular meant a lot to me through my teens. Respect where it's due to Clint Eastwood and Liam Neeson and Charles Bronson and Willis and Schwarzenegger and all those guys. Chow Yun-Fat and Tony Lung and Wu's films were the badasses I idolized. Male action heroes who could be overwhelmed by their emotions, who cried, felt pain, and demonstrated sensitivity helped me feel okay about my own emotions growing up. It's a refreshing change of pace, particularly when the stereotypical, muscle-bound, and stone-faced action hero who never shows a shred of emotion has always been, and still is, the go-to in Western markets. This very trend is ultimately what would end Wu's hot streak and hurt his reputation as a director. More on that later. John Woo also became a big point of reference for my friends and I at the time. In the mid-2000s, it seemed like everyone was making a John Woo movie except the man himself, and even though none of my pals were quite as obsessed with film as I was, we were all regular moviegoers, and comparing these action films brought us together. Two of the guys in our friend group were first-generation Chinese, and I vividly remember us turning off the subtitles for The Killer once so that they could better translate the more complicated ideas being explored in the dialogue on the fly. Also, I roped them into making some of my first films at the time, which were just John Woo-inspired gunfights strung together with the most ludicrous plots imaginable, one of which I'm unfortunately about to show you right now. Oh, fuck. On that note, let's move from the man and his style to the four films that put him on the map. The aforementioned trademarks are on full display in the first entry of what's been dubbed the heroic bloodshed genre. But what surprises and resonates about A Better Tomorrow is that on top of being a balls-to-the-wall action flick, it tells a fantastic, layered, time-jumping story of failure, redemption, and love. Sung Tsi Ho is a respected triad elder being pulled in different directions by longtime associate Mark and his younger brother Kit, who's in training to be a police detective. A deal gone wrong in Taiwan earns Ho a lengthy stretch in the pen, when the triads attempt to kidnap his ailing father as well, hoping to secure a bargaining chip so he keeps his mouth shut in prison, it backfires, and Kit ends up watching him die. The relationship between the brothers disintegrates, the volatile Mark takes revenge and is crippled, Kit ends up on warpath with the triads, and once Ho gets out of prison, the three struggle to reconcile their differences and form a fragile alliance in an attempt to take back their lives. A Better Tomorrow is a very pacey 95 minutes, but by the time the credits roll, you feel as though you've seen a very grand, epic story. The way Wu employs hyper-stylized Western archetypes with Eastern sensibilities, in a way that wasn't really improved upon or taken back until Reservoir Dogs, is arresting. The central performances from T. Lung, the late Leslie Chung, who also sings the theme song, and Chow Yun-Fat, are emotive and electric. 
Brief shout out to the first, not the second sequel. It's preposterous. They bring characters back to life in ridiculous ways to maintain the original cast, up the ante with scenery chewing to the point that it becomes comical, and generally seem to be having fun with themselves and the first film. Wu hated the idea of sequels, and later claimed he only made the thing to give friend Dean Sheck, who was struggling to find work, something high profile. But where it is disappointing narratively, and that's what I've just been singling out about the first film for the past few minutes, he goes even more ham on some impressive set pieces, and the infamous eat the rice scene must be seen to be believed. This fucking fried rice stinks! Holy oh, what? Hey. Perhaps Wu's most prestigious and recognizable effort, and the film that earned him his most significant international success, is The Killer. It's a film that Hollywood very sneakily adores. They've been trying to remake it for years, with or without Wu himself. During a hit, an assassin named De Jong accidentally blinds a young nightclub singer, Jenny, and is compelled by guilt to watch over and help her. Eventually, they even fall in love. That she has no knowledge of who he really is compounds his guilt, and the way that Chow Yun-Fat and Sally Ye play these characters with an almost old Hollywood earnestness makes the narrative very affecting. Things get worse for them both when Ajong's employer, worried about the heat he's brought on, decides to rub them both out to tie off loose ends. Danny Lee is also fantastic as a cop on the case who can't decide if he hates or admires Ajong. His sense of duty and compassion make him an outlier in a morally bankrupt world where cops and triads alike are shown to only be in it for themselves. Religious iconography is desecrated and destroyed, civilians are gunned down carelessly, and good people are brutally humiliated for trying to do the right thing. Amidst all of this, a cop and a criminal find strange common ground and eventually end up on the same side. This was Wu cementing his voice. The film moves very smoothly between action and emotion with montages and a haunting score. The church finale is masterful, both as a set piece and as an operatic collision course of the film's themes and the emotional arcs of the characters. You know how that great dance scene in Pulp Fiction almost continues Mia and Vincent's conversation for them, and expands on the inner feelings of the characters in a visual, organic way? Well, that's how John Woo uses action, especially here. The plot isn't just a vehicle to deliver action scenes, and the emotions of the story aren't window dressing for them. As an auteur, Wu went apeshit with the killer, but that wasn't to everyone's liking at the time domestically. His former producer, Tsui Hark, wasn't seeing a lot of money in emotional and tragic movies about good people falling victim to a corrupt society, and the two had a bitter falling out during attempts at a prequel to A Better Tomorrow. Tsui Hark was and is a huge figure in the industry, and while moving on to helm the worst film in the trilogy himself, he slandered Wu's name all over town, deriding him as hard to work with. This made it essentially impossible for Wu at the peak of his powers to secure funding for anything. Backed into a corner, Wu decided to self-fund the most ambitious and political film of his career.
I fucking love this movie, and I always have. It's my personal favorite of his filmography, but I'm not going to pretend it doesn't have some pretty glaring flaws. Wu was never shy about his Western influences, but the plot beats of Bullet, or more aptly and appropriately translated, Blood in the Streets, are sometimes distractingly similar to The Deer Hunter. Wu's heightened, maximalist style doesn't always translate smoothly to a rugged war movie, something we'd see even clearer with Wind Talkers years on. It's a little tonally wonky, and certain events in the plot do stretch credibility, absolutely. Still, there's real awesome power to this thing, and the great performances more than sell it. The horrific events at Tiananmen Square in 1989 inform a great deal of the film and its reckoning with national identity. To address the massacre directly just a year after it happened, out of context or not, was a super ballsy move, and it earned Wu plenty of scorn from audiences in mainland China at the time. In his own words, he felt that he couldn't hide from it and that the people of China shouldn't either. In 1990, the Hong Kong handover was fast approaching, and it's here that we see the first threads of the director grappling with his future. He also goes on to reference famous images from the Vietnam War throughout, using that event's moral turmoil to reflect his own turbulent feelings. Western audiences seem to be connecting with his work, but would he be selling out if he emigrated? Appropriately, Bullet in the Head is his purest artistic statement, often lampooning and eviscerating authority, the forces of greed and control, and the thirst for material wealth in a troubled world. This is also Tony Lung at his best. The scene where he pops shit in a sit-down with a mob boss leading into the very events Mark described in A Better Tomorrow is fucking icy. Oh my god. Oh my god. Lastly, there's the one that started it all for me. Hard-boiled is Wu's response to the success of Die Hard and Dirty Harry, fashioning his own tough-as-nails hero in Inspector Tequila, as well as an undercover story where, interestingly and importantly, we don't know a major character is a cop from the outset leaving us to speculate on his conflicted behavior. The Hong Kong handover looms large over the story once again, with characters discussing immigration as early as the opening scene. Barbara Chares has a great piece in the Criterion liner notes examining the film's attitude towards the handover, and how gangsters taking over a hospital in the film's finale may represent Wu's mindset, as an environment he expected to nurture him became hostile and dangerous. The hospital itself is also built on top of a weapons cache, again demonstrating Wu's preoccupation with the notion that violence and corruption underpin even the most sacred of institutions. I'd guess this is also the film with the most explosions in the Criterion Collection. Having made a more personal effort with Bullet in the Head, Wu used Hard Boiled as a sort of audition for Western markets, and catered it more to that palette. He also had no intention of closing out his Hong Kong oeuvre with a whimper. This is, without a doubt in my mind, the best straight-up action movie I've ever seen. I'm fairly certain it's a big reason we all became obsessed with epic one-take shots. There's a riveting three-minute sequence where Chow Yun-Fat and Tony Leung blast their way through two floors of a hospital, in which the art team actually redress the same floor for them while they're in the elevator.
Tony Lung was almost blinded by exploding glass. Chow Yun-fat's hair was singed off. The shoot was shut down multiple times by the cops due to the noise and destruction, and Wu had to cut deals with them to continue the film. Also, sadly, it's where the hot streak ended. Wu emigrated to the United States as a controversial figure in his home country, and found himself even more alienated by the bureaucracy of shooting processes, studio influence, and micromanaging in Hollywood. Wu was pigeonholed as a proper action director, and in the US in the 90s that meant glistening muscles, one-liners, and a reverent tone, an overbearing MPAA, and stars known more for their stunts than their emoting. There's fun to be had with Hard Target and Face Off, sure, though they never reached the same heights as his Hong Kong output. But aside from that, Wu's projects in the US were a succession of total mismatches. He eventually returned to China for Red Cliff, a handsomely mounted epic that sees some of his trademark themes come out to play, and also recently directed Manhunt for Netflix, which has a skillful action sequence at the halfway mark, but otherwise is overstuffed, overplotted, and very silly. All of this makes these four classics feel even more special. They've made an indelible impression on the crime genre and the way action is shot, and thematically they present a coherent arc of an individual artist's unique, often imitated, but never equaled voice. The kind of voice modern action movies sorely lack.